Our next speaker today is one of the best known researchers in the world of UFO phenomena. But what is of uh, particular note is that his entire career as a ufologist has been in parallel with his role as a government scientist. He was part of the aviary group, codename Seagull. He studied physics at Worcester Polytechnic Institute and then at American University where he got his master's and PhD. In 1972, he commenced his career at the Naval Service Surface Warfare Center, where he worked on optical data processing, lasers, the Strategic Defense Initiative, and ballistic missile defense, and is presently involved in a program related to homeland security. Our speaker's other career began when he joined the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, and he was active in research and investigation for the organization until it closed in 1980. He had joined MUFON in 1975 and was subsequently appointed to the position of State Director for Maryland, a position he still holds. In 1979, he was instrumental in establishing the Fund for UFO Research and was a chairman for 13 years. He presently serves on the National Board of the Fund. He's the author or co-author of about three dozen technical articles and more than 100 UFO articles over the last 30 years. He is co-author with Edward Walters of UFOs Are Real, Here's the Proof, and the author of the UFO FBI Connection and the novel Abduction in My Life. He's listed in Who's Who in Technology Today and American Men and Women of Science. Our speaker is one of the most interviewed researchers in the field, including print, radio, and TV media since 1978. He's also appeared in a number of documentaries. Please welcome Dr. Bruce McAbee to X Conference 2008. Well, folks, you've heard from the man in black. Now you're going to hear from the man in white. Anyway. We're going to get to the tales of the hawk. And <clears throat> hawk is a code name for a retired Air Force colonel. Uh, it's, it's a lot easier just to refer to him as hawk. The reason that I'm discussing hawk now, even though my investigation of him was 20 years ago, actually, 23, 22, 23 years ago, is because of a book written by uh, uh, former Air Force Captain Robert Collins. Collins was at the Foreign Technology Division and starting in 1985, Foreign Technology Division at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. And this is where he started asking some questions about UFOs, and some people there said, Oh, you ought to talk to this guy here who has uh, been interested in it for a long time. And that's how uh, Collins discovered Hawk, and then he uh, introduced Hawk to me. I talked to him on the phone numerous times, sort of long interviews, and then I actually met him. So uh, what you're about to hear is information that sort of is similar to what John Alexander just talked about, second-hand or third-hand type of information. So-and-so said so-and-so to me. But Hawk had a couple of his own experiences, which are quite uh, bizarre. Now, in this book, which was just written a few years ago, it's now up to the third edition, in this book, the period of time that I was interviewing Hawk is just completely glossed over. No mention of it at all. That's why what I'm about to tell you is interesting, because you can see in his book what, what the follow-on was, how Hawk was a major uh, force in, uh, the re in uh, what ended up being the so-called UFO cover-up live show. How many people here ever saw that? That was in October of 1988. You can get it on DVD, supposedly, I would imagine, somewhere. Um, how that came about is told in this book. But the stories that I'm about to tell you are not told in this book. So this is what you're going to hear is a backstory from uh, what I call the Hawk Tales. Now, as I said, this is based on interviews that were done um, 23 and 22 years ago. He retired uh, in 1979 from the Air Force. He had been in charge of this advanced physics division at FTD when he was, when he was active. And uh, he emphasized in his uh, discussions with me that if you could understand the infrastructure, then you can decide that you, you can get a good idea to look for where to look for covert UFO-related activities. And he offered to help us look for the, uh, understand what the infrastructure was. 
He also said that he had, um, uh, most of what he was going to tell me was based on what he had been told, but uh, he had his own experiences. So there's two types of information from Hawk. One is his own personal stuff, which then you hear from me, which is like, your, from your point of view, that's secondhand, and uh, but I can pretty well guarantee that what he told me is what, what I'm going to tell you. And um, then there's the information that he was told by other people, which uh, is second or third hand, depending on how you want to look at it. So his first experience comes when he's a, uh, isn't even in the Air, the, uh, Air Force dir uh, directly himself. He's in Reserve Officers Training Corps, was taken on a tour of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And on his tour, they're going through one building and after another, you know, looking at the various research projects and so on. And uh, he was with several other people walking along when they ended up in the, what he calls the wrong place. Somehow they wandered into an area where they weren't supposed to be. And uh, they were walking through a big long building and saw the rest of the tour group and was way ahead of them, so they decided to take a shortcut through some small uh, cubicles, you might say. And as they're walking through, they see these flying saucer models, or what looked like flying saucer models, along with other mid -tunnel, wind tunnel models. There were, there were wind tunnel models of your standard aircraft shape with a fuselage and wings and so on. And then there were these round things that looked like disks with domes on the top. They're all models, and uh, you know, this is a standard technique for wind tunnel tests to find out the aerodynamics. You make a model of what it is, you put it inside a, a, uh, a long chamber where the air blows down through at high speed, and you see what happens to the, uh, the, the lift, if there are any lift characteristics, or um, how it's going to fly in the real world. And at this time, while they're standing there looking at these models, one of the students said uh, his father had been briefed on uh, UFOs and flying saucers. So this stuck in uh, Hawk's mind, but he didn't do anything about it at the time. He just noted that it was interesting. He was interested in the flying saucer model, more interested in the flying wing model that he saw there. But he recalled the saucer and gave a careful verbal description. And his description of this one foot diameter model was this. The underside of it, there was a circular ring around, and then the underside was beveled down to not a bowl shape, but it had a formation under it. Then the top had another relief formation and then another relief formation as you kind of sliced a World War I submarine in two without the conning tower and made everything flatter. But you know where there was a Boeing? It was like that. And then there was a cockpit area in the center. And then there was something like a flaring back from there. Now, I sent Hawk a picture of an actual UFO sighting that occurred uh, May 24th, 1949. This is case 10 of special Project Blue Book special report for number 14. How many people are familiar with that? This is a uh, special report 14 was done in 1955 by uh, Project Blue Book people. They published it, but it was done by, uh, in, in conjunction with the Battelle Memorial Institute. And they analyzed 3,200 and some sightings uh, in a very detailed manner using computer analysis and so on. But as they went through these 3,201 sightings, they picked out 12 that they considered to be the best cases. And this is one of them right here. And you can see the way this thing is drawn. This was a uh, draw, this report was made directly to the, uh, uh, the uh, National Academy of, National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics by the person, one of the people who was a witness. There were two witnesses who worked at Ames Research Laboratory in um, uh, just uh, near San Francisco, where they did classified research on uh, flight tech uh, characteristics. And one guy was a uh, uh, draftsman, the other guy was a wind tunnel mechanic. Then there were three other witnesses. So a total of five people witnessed this thing in May 24th, 1949. And uh, this thing was observed to come they were facing towards the east. They were on the Rogue River uh, in Oregon fishing. And they were using binoculars to look around and see if there were fish jumping anywhere. And they saw this thing come in from their left-hand side, that is from the north, stop, hover, sit there for a minute or more, rotate on its axis, and then take off at a speed comparable to that of a jet. Made no noise. They thought the thing was maybe a mile away from them. So this drawing and this report we're in, uh, as I said, the special report 14. Here's the drawing that Hawk made. The 
This is what he said he saw when he was in the early 1950s uh, taking a, uh, a sort of a semi-illegal tour <laughs> through part of uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Okay, his second experience is uh, more bizarre than that. He became a meteorologist and was signed, stay, uh, assigned to a post in Japan in October 1957 as a staff weather officer. He was told at that time that there had been a couple of F-106s, which were new jets at the time, that were specially instrumented and stationed on several islands near Japan. Uh, it was a new type of aircraft at the time. Two of them were at Masawa, which is the northern end of the main Japanese island of Honshu, two at Okinawa, a small island southwest of Honshu. I was told that they were especially instrumented F-106s. I thought that was strange because the 106 was just being introduced in the States. I didn't learn any more about them until 1957, or in 1957. About a year later, in the spring of 59, F-106s were available by then. I was in the combat operations center, and it was early in the evening. It was just getting to be dusk. I was giving the weather forecast, as I always did, because I was a staff weather officer to the Combat Operations Center. I'll just tell you the story of what happened, and you can take it for whatever you want. So you can imagine this is him talking to you people right now. While I was there, one of the guys, because they had a big graphic board that you write upside down on and all that kind of wonderful stuff, people who are putting on the symbols for the weather, you know, on a, on a big board that everybody can see that in the Operation Control Center. Because they had a big graphic board that you write upside down on and all that kind of wonderful stuff, he invited me in to see some of the operations and hot work. So we were standing there when all of a sudden all hell broke loose and everybody got excited and one of the guys blurted out, they're back again. And I said, what is back again? The fellow who was escorting me through the facility because I gave briefings there because I gave briefings there all the time on the weather. And so they were plotting all the aircraft and so on on the large graphic board. There were no aircraft uh, in the area where this event occurred. And they had just plotted uh, something just south of Masawa, up between Honshu and Hokkaido, the main North Island of Japan, but on the Pacific Ocean side in that area. And he, the guy who was acting as a guide, says to me, there is an unidentified object flying there, a uh, flying object there. And I said, why is that important? Or something to that effect. And he says, we have them quite frequently. And he said, they travel around 2,000 miles an hour. And he said, for some strange reason, it is quite frequent that one of them will stop. They were just usually in groups of two or three, and one would just stop and hover in a stationary position. So the guys doing the radar were plotting the radar locations on this big screen where you're right upside down and so on. And he said, um, they will stay there anywhere from half an hour to several hours, maybe even up to three hours, and then they proceed between the two islands, and then they disappear off the scope so you can't track them. In other words, they go between that strait in there, which is the, between Honshu and Hokkaido, toward the Sea of Japan, and then they just disappear off the screen. So if you can imagine what Japan looks like with an island this way and an island this way and a gap in between, he's talking about them hovering over the gap area between the islands. Then somebody who was in this control center asked, you know, shall we scramble them, which implies scrambling some jets. The implication being that they don't like having these things hovering up there, so we better do, take some action and find out what it is. And I said to my friend, what are they talking about? And he said, the two especially instrumented F-106s, they've been especially instrumented to track and fire on these things. The commander who was there said, we'll scramble. Do you think it will stay there? And someone else said, yeah, it's behaving like it has done before. So the commander says, let's scramble. So now they put in a phone call to uh, one of the islands to um, see if they can scramble an F-106. And so they ordered a scramble, but the report came back that one of the planes couldn't get fully functional. He was having difficulty with his instruments. And so the commander says, damn, there it goes again. We've had this every time we've tried to scramble. And the other guy, the other pilot of the other aircraft, says, I'm functionally OK. Got two navigation aids out, but everything else appears OK. And my special sensor is operating. So the commander says, go ahead and launch. Then someone said, shall we proceed with just one? And there was some hemming and hawing for about a minute or less. And then the commander said, go ahead. They then asked me for a forecast. Fortunately, he had just happened to be in the room there, and they needed a forecast to know what the, what the uh, F-106 pilot would find when he starts going upwards to the altitude of this object. 
I told them there were some low clouds and a middle layer of cloud in there, and oh, I've forgotten about 15, 16,000 feet or something like that, but I said clear, clear on top with just a light cirrus, cirrus stratus above that, and there was a full moon, and uh, so someone said, yep, then he won't have any trouble tracking this object. The pilot then climbed on out, and after a minute or so, said he was clear on top. Then there were a few minutes, maybe eight or 10 minutes, and then he says, he's got it in sight. Because there was a general interest in what was happening, the radar operators turned on a speaker system, and that way we could hear the downlink voice from the pilot. So now Hawk could not hear what the controllers were saying, but he could hear what the pilot was saying. Everybody in the room could hear what, was the, what the pilot was saying. And uh, he said he's got it in sight. Um, the radar operators had a tie-in with the Masawa operators on the radars, and they were the only ones who could hear the ground link up. So we heard only one half the conversation. That is what the pilot was saying. They were vectoring him in, and then he said, I've got it in sight. He described the object as round or circular, a metallic object that was hovering. It had a cockpit or something like vertical stabilizers similar to what I saw on those models. Remember his drawing. In fact, he was describing what I saw on those models. So I thought, well, gee, that's very interesting. And he said it was a UFO, and he had it in sight, and he asked, should I make a firing pass? And the men in the control room said, we better get authority for that. Now here's a Hawk talking about his own experience as a weather officer. I worked over there for two or three years, and I was in typhoon forecasting. It was high priority. And if you ever tried to get single sideband back in those days, that was the latest advance in communications. It was still difficult to get communication back. So what he's saying is a priority message that there's a typhoon coming. He wants to send information to uh, the Pentagon or whoever needs the information. Uh, he would have a special way of getting a high priority channel on this so-called single sideband, which is a particular way of handling radio signals. And so he was expecting uh, a, some, some short delay, but not some delay, but not too long, and being able to send this message out and get a response back that, well, yes, we got your message. <clears throat> So they got a communication link in less than five minutes, which impressed the heck out of Hawk, I guess. <laughs> uh, and uh, he said, we'll call the Pentagon to get the authority, and it came back and said, yes, we'll make the firing pass. So presumably, you know, if Hawk's story is correct, so up to this point, what you've got is <clears throat> a couple of objects come along that are picked up on radar by some installations in Japan. One object ho hovers over the gap between the two islands, uh, the other object takes off, and while this object is hovering, they decide to scramble an aircraft. They originally try to scramble two aircraft that are specially instrumented. He didn't know what this instrumentation was supposed to do. Special aircraft that uh, would go up and view this thing, and then they would decide what to do about it. So at this, uh, at this point, then, they've decided, uh, they've sent a message to the Pentagon saying, we got one of these things here, what are we going to do about it? <clears throat> and they get a message back saying, well, fire on it. The pilot said, okay, we'll roll in. So he rolled in and he fired off his missiles. Now, <clears throat> Hawk didn't specify what the missiles were, but I presume these are some uh, version of the uh, Sidewinder missile available at the time, which would be a heat-seeking missile. And then all of a sudden, he went into a strange type of falsetto voice I had never heard before. He blurted out that he fired and they had detonated, but did not hit it. In other words, the missiles didn't make it to the target, but they blew up anyway. They detonated just at the edge of it, like a shield, he said, like an invisible shield. And he said, it doesn't look like any of the shrapnel or anything penetrated through. And he says, they've turned on some kind of beam, and they're turning. That is, the whole object was rotating. And then he says, they're coming after me. And he went into a very controlled diving maneuver. And then the radar operator started screaming out, it's moving, it's vectoring towards him. And then they started counting out the ranges as the distance was shrinking. So at this point, standing in the control tower listening to the control room, listening to what's going on, Hawk is hearing something that few people, I would hope, have ever heard. A, a flying saucer starting to an attack. I get it looks like an attack on a, uh, a jet aircraft. And the pilot was just breathing, breathing heavy and obviously under great control, stress, but controlled. And he said, it's moving closer. And he just kept describing how it kept gaining on him, and this beam was coming towards him. And then the radar operator said, contact. So the guys on the ground see these two blips 
on the radar screen, a little dot that represents the airplane and a, another dot that represents the UFO. They merged. Contact. Two blips matched, and then the radar operator said, there's no separation. And then he says, the thing has stopped. It's just now a single blip hovering, but there's nothing else. And what happened then is, for four days after that, I gave weather, weather briefings every day for a search up there, and they never did find anything. Now, is this story true? Is this something that Hawk actually saw? Did it actually happen? Do we have any records of it? If it actually happened, there are records somewhere, I'm sure. Buried. Donna said, <laughs> nobody's interested in this stuff, but it goes somewhere. Maybe nobody pays any attention to it afterwards. But you know, from Hawk's story, the implication is they were prepared for this event, something like it. At that time, I did not know about UFOs, and I just didn't take it for anything unusual. I just thought, oh well, some kind of experimental aircraft, and somebody was after him because, like I said, I couldn't have cared less. But taking this event at face value, there are several things that come out of it. Number one, and here's Hawk talking, number one is the Air Force was prepared. Those airplanes were in position for a year and a half before that incident took place. The guy who was telling me said that the UFOs had a routine pattern of operation, and that's why we positioned those aircraft on the islands. For some reason, there was a regular pattern established by the UFOs. Number two is that the Air Force denies they ever had an aircraft shot down by a UFO. And number three is that they always deny they ever tried to shoot down a flying saucer. So the Air Force denies that a saucer, denies attacking saucers, and the Air Force denies that saucers ever attacked the air, uh, an Air Force plane. Now we know more recent events, for example, this has been mentioned earlier, the, uh, the F-4 jet case in Iran, where uh, when the jet, two jets, one after another, approached and got to within a distance, according to their own radar, of about 25 nautical miles, and all of a sudden their uh, communications got very, very fuzzy and they couldn't even communicate with the guy in the back seat. Now that's, I presume, a hardwired communication. I don't know how you stop that. But anyway, um, that's sort of like a, not a direct attack on the F-4 maybe, but something close to it. And I don't know that, that the Air Force ever had any official statement about uh, the Iranian jet case. We know that some documents got leaked out, and that's how we found out about it. And uh, just as recently as last November, the uh, pilot of the second F-4 jet, um, Harvaz Jaf Jafari, was here at the press conference that was held uh, last November in Washington, D.C. And uh, I got to talk to him. I had written a large report on this thing years ago and actually put it on my website uh, a year or so ago, the, re the report as told by the air traffic controller. So anyway, that was the F-4 situation in, in, uh, in Iran. Uh, presumably, we never would have heard about it if it hadn't been for the fact that somebody, I think it was Colonel Evans of the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency, who leaked that document to um, Jack, Jack Acuff of NICAP in 1976. Anyway, continuing with uh, Hawk, he says, beyond, beyond that, I can't say much except that I never heard that falsetto voice again until I went to Air Command School in 1967, where I heard some tapes from some wild weasel pilots. Now, these were the guys over uh, um, Vietnam, where they had the Vietnamese had installed SAM, surface-to-air missiles, that would attack the uh, jet aircraft as they're flying over to do their bombing runs. In order to, uh, a SAM missile was another type of heat-seeking missile. And once one of these things is launched, you have on your aircraft, you have a, a uh, device that's monitoring what's going on with this missile. You know, and you can tell when it's coming up and when it's getting behind you and so on. The objective is to avoid being hit by the missile, obviously. Well, they had, uh, they what. Our, our guys wanted to know where the missiles were going to be launched from. So they would send out special pilots, the so-called wild weasels, to go out and draw on uh, and actually accept an attack. That is, you fly along and wait for this guy down the ground to launch his missile. Then somebody else comes along behind you and zaps the place where the missile was launched from. But now you've got a missile tailing you. Now what do you do about it? So, and he said that he had heard some tapes from some wild weasel pilots, and it sounded like a wild weasel jet fighter pilot when he says, they've launched a missile from the ground, and then it's coming up 
but the jet pilot can't find it, he doesn't know where it is, and there's controlled terror in the voice that switches to a high falsetto. So he's saying, when he heard the pilot in F-106 in 1957 off the coast of uh, Japan, is the voice go up into this high falsetto controlled fear, you might say. He didn't hear that, he had never heard that before, and didn't hear it again until he heard some wild weasel pilot tapes in 1967. Okay, so that finishes Hawk's own personal experience with a very uh, sensational type of case. And if, if this were to be taken seriously, you know, if it could be proven, if you could actually dig up the records, uh, it would be kind of hard to uh, deny that we've got flying saucers doing things around the world that, um, that we can't do. So anyway, after Japan, Hawk went back to school and then to the Electronic Systems Division of the Air Force at the Cambridge Liber uh, Cambridge Research Laboratory, which is near Boston. Hawk became involved with the study of nuclear weapons effects during atmospheric tests in the 1960s, and he became a consultant on the uh, instrumentation of those tests. He went to a conference on nuclear effects in 1964 in Albuquerque, New Mexico, at the Kirtland Air Force Base, and Sandia Laboratory with an Air Force Cambridge Research Laboratory colleague by the name of Robert Hitler. And this guy, Hippler, plays a significant role in things that uh, even Hawk didn't realize. But anyway, during a dull part of the conference, a Sandia scientist, whose name is not recalled, offered to give Bob and Hawk a tour of the facility where they did atomic radiation experiments with large animals. So Bob and Hawk and some others drove south from the Sandia lab to a special installation where there were animal pens and a building and a small guard tower which is east of the present-day solar power tower. So if anybody ever were to go out to Albuquerque, New Mexico, you can actually go in. You can tell them you're going to the Atomic Power Museum, the Atomic Energy Museum at Sandia. And you can get through the guard gate. Uh, you know, as a civilian, you don't need any big clearance to get onto the base. And then you can keep on driving. You go way back. They have a, uh, the, the solar power tower set, set up as a, a, a situation where, I don't know when that was, 20 or 30 years ago, they built this test system to have a whole bunch of mirrors concentrating sunlight at one particular focal point where they uh, were, were determining how much power they could get out of the sun under certain conditions. But not far from that is a, uh, what, what he says here, animal pens in a building with a small guard tower. And when I was checking up uh, on what Hawk said, I found what I believe is that installation. 1986. Anyway, there they saw a vault where there were a nuclear radiation source was operated. While at the nuclear installation, they noticed a number of Army and Navy doctors that did autopsies on irradiated animals. And the shielding for this uh, system, he said, was three layers of battleship steel plus lead. Then someone pointed out, that, now I might mention that the experiment that they were doing was, he said, they would put a cow or some animal inside some room, which was itself completely contained and, and radiation shielded from the outside. So no radiation could get out. Then they would bring up from underground some radiation source, hold it there for a period of time, put that radiation source back down into the ground, and then they would measure whatever had happened to the, the animal. Then someone pointed out the large number of doctoral degrees held by the Navy doctors who were doing these experiments. 24 degrees for three of them, they say. The question was, what research needs so many degrees? And the answer was, the degrees were needed for autopsies of humanoids, by which he meant aliens. Now this supposedly is what some people are telling Hawk and this guy Bob while they're, while they're visiting this nuclear installation. The general response of Hawk and the others in this group was, this must be bullshit. But Bob wanted to check it out. He was invited to the administration building. Hawk didn't go because he wasn't interested. Uh, an hour and a half later, Bob came back and started talking about what he had seen. Bob said he saw pictures of three whole bodies of non-human creatures, ET aliens and bits and pieces of others and so on. Three whole bodies were at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Now you have to understand, this is Hawk telling me what he claims to have been told by Bob Hitler back in 1964. Bob said that the doctors were astounded. According to them, there was no esophagus, no stomach, no reproductive system. Also, the blood was different. Not green or anything like that, but different about five feet tall with tiny features and bone structure and slanted eyes. Bob wanted to get assigned to this project, but he was told, you don't ask, they invite you. 
Bob was told of several installations around Albuquerque where secret alien work was done. Bob was told the famous Sandia Peak Tramway Company was set up to provide cover for alien work in the Albuquerque area. How many people have ever been to uh, Albuquerque? How many people have been up Sandia Peak? <laughs> Very few. Well, that was a, you can get on this cable car and ride way up to the top of the mountain. Anyway, um, Bob and Hawk toured Albuquerque looking for the installations, including a clubhouse where the control group met. Bob and Hawk found several of the buildings. Years later, now remember this is back in 1964 when Bob and Hawk are driving around trying to find evidence that these people uh, actually had a group that was meeting and doing research on, uh, on aliens. Years later, 1985, investigations by myself and by Bill Moore found the same installations and buildings, generally confirming what Hawk said about the existence of these buildings, although it was not possible to prove that the tramway company had been founded as a cover organization. We looked up the history of it. It's One of those things where, yeah, it could be very cleverly done, but um, there'd be little or no way of proving it without getting some one of the original founders of the tramway organization to uh, admit to something. Here's a map that Hawk, he took a regular map and then wrote all over it. You can see the, the, the descriptions and where the buildings were and uh, where in 1968 he's claiming that there was a special meeting of the equivalent of MJ-12, whether it was called that or not, uh, a meeting at this clubhouse at the uh, near the bottom of the uh, tramway. Here's his map of um, where the uh, nuclear installation was and, uh, let me see here, I don't have a pointer. Down here in the lower right-hand corner, you see his drawings of X's and so on. That's where this installation supposedly was. That was still there in 1985. The buildings were still there. The place had been abandoned for a long time. It was all grown over. Um, but the uh, tower, the little tower was still there fences around it and so on. I actually went into the, into the room, into the building itself, and looked around, but there wasn't anybody there. So anyway, back in 1964, Bob and Hawk toured the Albuquerque. Bob left, Bob left the Air Force Cambridge Research Laboratory. About a year later, this would be 1965, Bob visited AFCRL AFC and bumped into Hawk. Bob told Hawk he had gotten the assignment and now worked for the real Project Blue Book. And Hawk says to me, Bob repeated that, said that three times, the real Project Blue Book. Hawk did not know what that was, so he didn't pursue the matter. But that makes it sound like there was a Blue Book, and then there was a real Project Blue Book. From Hawk's testimony, it appeared that Robert Hippler had joined the inside group. This is me talking. However, during this investigation of Hawk's testimony, Hippler, to me, was just a fable. I didn't even know if he was a real person. So in other words, as I'm listening to Hawk in 1985, 1986, tell me about this, what this guy Hippler has told him, you know, which is pretty amazing stuff. We got uh, scientists, Navy scientists, doctors working on, on aliens somehow or other. Hippler was just a fable. So in, 1960, in 1985, 1986, I was reading through notes written by uh, Dr. James McDonald I had his file of stuff. Now, McDonald died in 72 or 73. The Navy had kept records, that, things, file, documents that McDonald had sent to the Navy. McDon James McDonald in, this, in the 50s and 60s was a well-known atmospheric scientist. He was doing project work for the Navy. The Navy, uh, his, his uh, contract monitor, had a file on uh, McDonald that is all the documents that McDonald had sent him, which included a lot of letters. And in the 1960s, McDonald got interested in the UFO subject. And in the lead up to the Condon, the time during the lead up to the Condon study, 1965, 66, 67, that time frame, McDonald became very active in running around trying to uh, get, uh, giving lectures at numerous government and, co or, and company organizations. And, uh, he wrote back to uh, James Hughes, who was his contract monitor, numerous letters about what he was doing. And in one of these letters that I was reading, a letter that was written in 1967, I think it was, or see, written in 1966, I was reading a letter written by Dr. James McDonald to James Hughes, and in it he, he's discussing how uh, 
uh, the, the government or the Air Force was trying to find some university to take on this study, which was ultimately taken on by the um, University of Colorado. But at the time of this letter, no, organ, no university had said, okay, we'll do your UFO study. Uh, for those of you who don't remember, which is probably most of you, 65, 66 was a time of a big flap of sightings in the United States. Um, there was congressional pressure on the Air Force to, to fund an independent investigation because Blue Book had lost all credibility, especially when Dr. J. Allen Hynek in early 1966, after some sightings in Hillsdale, Michigan, and so on, said, ah, oh, this is all swamp gas. That was where the famous swamp gas stuff came from. The Air Force uh, was losing a lot of credibility. People weren't believing that the Air Force was treating this thing uh, in a reasonable manner. So Congress directed the Air Force to have an, hold an independent study, and at this time in 1966, the time of this letter, the Air Force had not yet narrowed down on what organization, what university would actually do the study. So anyway, while I'm reading a letter written in 1966 by Dr. James McDonald, I came upon Hitler's name. And I can say as I was, my eyes were going along from left to right along this line of, of print, and I'm reading the sentence, and my eyes absolutely stopped moving when I saw Hitler. There was a shock to me. This guy was real. Not only that, but he was the person assigned by the Air Force Office of Scientific Research to find the organization, the university that was going to carry out the study. He was in charge of trying to contract out this project. <laughs> so that meant that he had considerable control over how this contract was going to be written. Well, so Hitler was a real guy. And as I said here, he is a historic character. He was in charge of locating a university to carry out the congressionally mandated UFO study. He had the perfect job if the, quote, real Project Blue Book wanted to affect or control this independent study. He didn't succeed in finding a university, so he, another top Air Force scientist completed the job a few months after Hitler stopped. But think about it. If this guy, Hitler, was part of the real Project Blue Book, and the real Project, Project Blue Book realizes, well, we've got to go along with the uh, public demand for an independent study, but we want to exert as much control over that study, make sure they come up with the, quote, right answer. Uh, that would be the way to do it anyway. In 1986, Hitler was contacted by Bill Moore to find out if he would say anything about the real Project Blue Book. He refused to talk about any of his UFO activities, even his publicly known activities leading up to the Conn study. The real Project Blue Book is still a mystery. Too bad Hawk didn't pay closer attention. And, uh, okay, so here's some other stories told by Hawk. Scared guards at Indian Springs in 1970. In 1970, Hawk was directed to set up seismometers in the caves uh, in the Indian Springs area of the National Test Site in Nevada. This is where they set off underground nuclear explosions to record seismic effects of nuclear explosions. Hawk went to the test site to install seismometers this involved traveling over many miles in the desert and mountains. Seismometers are devices that measure the shaking of the ground. If you, uh, you always heard, all heard about the Richter scale, I presume, and of the strength of an earthquake, and it's determined by how much uh, the signal is coming out of a seismometer. And I just had a 5.2 shock just two days ago in the Midwest. <clears throat> anyway, Hawk says, we drove to the test site, which is large, about 100 miles from north to south. It's a big area. There's a highway that goes right up the middle of it. As you drive, you keep climbing higher and higher, and higher and higher plateaus. We came to a gate across the road. The guard in the car in front of us opened the gate, and we went onward. Then we hit another gate. And then there were big signs saying, essentially, keep out government property. They were freshly painted. And we had to go on, so the guard said, you're going up in there. And we described where we had to go. And he said, I don't like it. I just don't like it. The guard was very nervous. So we went on and we came to two big signs, and the road is paved from there on. It goes right up the mountain towards Area 51. So we were like 30 miles from the top of the ridge, maybe 40, and we could see the pass up there. And there was a big sign, and it gave all kinds of huge warnings that said, you are approaching Area 51. I've forgotten all the details, but there were, kinds of war but there were all kinds of warnings that you could not go to Area 51, warnings of deadly force being used to keep people out. Mind you, this is after we went through two lock gates already. So they're penetrating into more and more classified area. Anyway, we went on up there and we turned left and went up to an old trail to one of, our, one of the old abandoned gold mines. We placed our seismometers in the mine. 
way back in the mine shaft. You have to get a good quiet place with good rock. And it was getting kind of late because we were having trouble balancing them, which is often the case because they're very, very delicate. So you imagine if you had something like a pendulum swinging and you had to make sure that everything was uh, perfectly steady um, as a reference for when the ground starts to shake. Anyway, um, so it was taking a little longer and the guard just said, I can't take it any longer. I've got to leave. So they had a guard along with them, see, to get them through all these gates that they had to go through. But he was getting nervous. He didn't want to stay there until nighttime. And we said to the guard, well, why? And he said, look, people have disappeared up in here. We have had numerous guards just literally disappear up in this area after dark. So we didn't give it any thought, but I've never seen anyone so antsy and nervous in my life. Anyway, he said he was leaving and he would go down and get to the second locked gate. He said, I'll leave the first one open for you. Just lock it when you get there, and I'll be past the second one because I'm not staying around here. The guard left. Well, it got dark, and it took a while. I'd say a good half an hour to 45 minutes from there to get out down to the gate. And so when we stopped and closed the gate, that's the first one, and it came down farther, we're still up on a high plateau. And we looked down on the next gate below, and there was a car. And it looked like somebody was pacing back and forth in the headlights of the car. That was the guard. He was pacing back and forth like a frightened animal. When we got there, he was just chain smoking one after another, and he said, you're alive. <laughs> and we said, yeah, well, he didn't crash or anything. <laughs> and he said, well, he said, no, no, that wasn't what, he says, no, no, that wasn't what I was worried about. And then he asked, did you see any UFOs? And we said, no, are we supposed to? He says, they're always up there. They usually come in about 10 o'clock or 11, sometimes a little later, like midnight. And any guards that have been up there have disappeared. He was literally amazed that we didn't see anything or that we had even come out. Okay, weathermen at Indian Springs. Recent investigation of the claims by Charles Hall. How many people have heard of him? The guy who writes about the tall whites. Has located several men who were weather observers in the early middle 1960s at Indian Springs, Nellis Air Force Base area. They claim they were aware of and afraid of strange things that happened at night in that area. Well, here's what Hawk had to say about scared guards at the McCormick Ranch, which is just an area, a large area south of Kirtland Air Force Base. In 1984, Hawk was working on a project near Kirtland Air Force Base. He was told by security guards around the McCormick Ranch area south of Kirtland that no one wanted to stay out at night because of UFOs. This was in the early 1980s, consistent with what I call a Kirtland Landing document of 1980. Um, I have on my website a paper entitled uh, Kirtland Landing, or Welcome to the uh, Cosmic Watergate, which is a discussion of actual events at Kirtland Air Force Base and east of Kirtland Air Force Base in a secure area run by the Sandia, uh, uh, Sandia National Laboratory. But anyway, Hawk's map showing the Coyote Canyon and McCormick Ranch is here. And I have an a, a arrow and a little box saying, area where the landing occurred in August of 1980, the Kirtland Landing document, I call that which is an actual document for, that you can get under the Freedom of Information Act from the Air Force Office uh, of um, what am I trying to think of? AFOSI, Air Force Office of, of Special Investigations. The McCormick Ranch is just west and south of Sandia Base, and we were working on some tests out there, and while we were waiting for a crane or something, we got to talking with some guards. They were all goosey as hell about staying out there. When it got close to dusk, they were going getting the hell out of there. So we were asking why, and then they were telling me, oh, these strange events of UFOs. They're telling me about the fact that they were a bit leery because they were moving, up the, th moving the things from the McCormick Ranch up to Coyote Canyon, and they said the fact is that very frequently UFOs are seen in the area. Now, here's um, Hawk saying, all I know is what the guy told me, and all I know is they would not stay at the McCormick Ranch. Several times we had to work late, and they weren't supposed to, but they gave me the combination to the gate and said, here it is, unlock it and get out yourself. <laughs> in fact, in recent years, and he told me this in 1984, in the early, and that's Hawk saying he was being told in, in the early 80s, they were running three or four sightings a week. The guard's statement about many sightings is supported by the AFOSI document, which reports the landing east of the Manzano weapon storage area, that is Kirtland Air Force Base, and three other sightings, in August 1980, what I call the Kirtland Landing document that you can get from the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. And I investigated this document, which by the way, was, by the way, how I got introduced myself to a guy by the name of Richard Doty, 
my only interaction with him was at, in the, investigating this particular series of events. But this particular document talks about um, the main, the Kirtland landing, what I call the Kirtland landing itself, was seen by a security guard of an object that had, was in a, in a, uh, inside an alarmed structure, that is a building with a big fence around it. And he's, he's driving his, his Jeep along. He sees this light inside the uh, alarm structure. It doesn't know what it is. He c tries to call back to uh, the base, the Sandia base headquarters, a distance of about four miles. Ordinarily, he would have good communication, but on this particular night, he wasn't able to communicate at all. So he gets, takes his gun, gets out of the Jeep, starts to walk towards this thing, and it suddenly takes off going straight up. Unbeknownst to this guard, there were several people at the Manzano Weapons Storage Area, people who drive around an area that had mountains. You can go out there and see where the mountains are now, but you don't see the big uh, double fence that they used to have around it. This Manzano Weapons Storage Area is where they actually stored nuclear weapons at various times. And the guards were going around and driving around the, uh, the, uh, the road that went around this area, the secure access road, and they saw this object, this light in the sky, drop down behind some mountains west east of their location. It was a minutes after that that the guard was driving along and he saw the thing on the ground. Now the guys back at the Manzano Weapons Storage Area couldn't see it at that point. It was behind some mountains. Next thing they know, they see a light shoot right straight up. And that was the thing that uh, this guard saw as he walked towards it. It took off going straight up. Well, on the second page of this current landing document, it talks about New Mexico State Police sighting a material object in, Mon in the Manzanos between uh, Beelan and Albuquerque, New Mexico, and so on. Reported it to Kirtland Air Force Base. And the Kirtland Public Information Office advised the patrolman in the U.S. Air Force no longer investigate such sightings unless they occur on a U.S. Air Force Base. Now, I the official position of the Air Force for years and years and years had been, we never investigate UFO sightings, period. Now we find out that, well, if it, ha if it happens to occur on an uh, Air Force base, yeah, we'll investigate. Here's a satellite map of Albuquerque showing the area that we're talking about, the Manzano Weapons Storage Area, uh, with these lines that go around and making a great big loop. That's where the big fences were, uh, a no man's land with tank traps practically and everything else, you know, to keep people out. And uh, to the right on that map, over to the right is where the uh, last bunker on the left was uh, the, the, the description of where that occurred. Okay, well that concludes my um, description of what I was told by Hawk 20 years ago. And how many minutes did I have? 10? Minutes. After, according to Collins's book, and I was not involved with any of the stuff that happened after I last saw Hawk. And my the last time I saw him was in February of 1986. We had dinner together, and he uh, further amplified on things that he had told me over the telephone. It was after that that uh, Hawk had arranged. Um, arranged to be a source, I guess you could say, for a show that turned out to be UFO Cover-Up Live, put on by a guy named Seligman. Uh, and uh, this, this was an, an attempt not only to release information to the general public, but to stir up the people on the inside and see if there was any reaction. And I've been told that there was, but I was not privy to most of that stuff. I was a, sort of an outside, a bystander, like the guy who gets shot, you might say. Cover-Up Live show was a pretty gutsy thing to do. Cover Up Live literally was a live TV show. By 1980s, people were doing canned TV shows all the time. But to actually put on something like they did in the 50s and 60s, when they had comedy shows and so on that were, that were live productions, by the time you got into the late 70s and 80s, they wanted to have everything canned so there's nothing going to go wrong with it. But putting on a live show was a little gutsy. And they not only had witnesses, uh, this is a two-hour show. They not only had witnesses in the United States lined up in various places throughout the United States, they even had a, 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 a TV connection by a satellite to the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union connection didn't work well, and that caused uh, changes. This whole show was scripted in the sense you were supposed to read a certain thing that you're supposed to say. Um, 
and that would make it make this thing, make the show run long very smoothly. But when the when the, uh, the collection of the Soviet Union suddenly started to fall apart, they started rewriting the things that people were supposed to say. <laughs> so the script was being changed during the show. <clears throat> anyway, it's, uh, for anyone who reads Collins' book, this testimony by Hawk that I have presented, and by the way, it's on my website, provides uh, an interesting backup that uh, you can't get now. Hawk is still alive, but he's not talking. Ever since Collins' book has come out, he has not said a word, at least that I'm aware of. And so what, you can, what I've just told you is he had his own experiences, and he recorded experiences of others. Now, in Collins' book, he goes a lot, a lot beyond what he told me. Uh, you'd have to get Collins' book to find out exactly what that is. But anyway, I'll take any questions. Hawk is not Pelican. But since you brought up Pelican, uh, I might mention that um, someday I might give a program called the Pelican Briefs. <laughs> Pelican is a source who uh, was informing me in the late 80s and early 90s of an investigation that was going on inside the government itself. And to some extent, it began in 1987 when I gave a lecture at the CIA. Now, in 1970, uh, December 1978, CIA um, uh, admitted that they had UFO documents and released 900 and some pages of stuff. That was as a result of a lawsuit that occurred in the summer of 19, well, occurred earlier than 1978. I think the lawsuit was originally filed in 77. The lawsuit, initially, the CIA said, we only have what is called the Robertson Panel Report documents. Anybody here familiar with the Robertson Panel Report? Apparently not. That was a, a study done in 19, early 1953, um, which basically uh, panned the whole UFO subject and suggested that debunking would be a good approach to the problem of what do we do about UFO sighting reports. So the CIA said that's all we had, and that would have been uh, 30, 40 pages of stuff maybe. Then a judge ordered the CIA to do a complete section-by-section um, -section search of the agency, and uh, when they did that, they came up with 900 pages. A lot of them were duplicates. A lot of them were copies of newspaper reports from uh, other countries, but there were a number of documents which showed that the CIA in the early, late 40s and early 50s was, in fact, reacting to the uh, UFO problem and almost set up a uh, uh, top-secret investigation themselves, which was, by the way, squashed by the Robertson panel. <laughs> So anyway, the CIA said we didn't have anything but the Robertson Panel Report. Then in December 1978, they released 900 pages of stuff. When I gave a talk at the CIA in 1987 in uh, July, um, I told them about their own documents. <laughs> Most of the people didn't know what had happened 10 years earlier. And so I was told afterwards, you created a lot of spies in the agency. There are a number of people who ask me, gee, what, can you, what, what, what should I do to learn more about this? You know, I said, well, <laughs> go and look in your own agency a little bit and see what's going on. Um, so anyway, uh, getting, these, uh, well, getting the, the agency right to uh, create these spies in the agency, and then over the next uh, five or six years, there are a number of people who are reasonably high levels there who were nosing around trying to find stuff. Uh, so far as I know, they never told me if they did find something. Um, so far as I know, they didn't find any uh, uh, inside group or whatever, and that's sort of consistent with what John is saying. Uh, I'm not sure they would have told me if they had found anything. But anyway, the Pelican, to read over the Pelican brief notes that I've got for five or six years' worth of uh, discussions, it's quite interesting to find out all these different people poking and looking into different holes here and there and see if they could find something. The talk I gave at the CIA was unclassified, lunchroom type of discussion. I was told that it was uh, given, uh, it was given in a room, it was a, obviously a conference room, and I was told it was the director's conference room, I didn't know. It was pretty well packed with people, and uh, as I said, as far as I could tell, few people, if any, knew that they had actually had UFO-related documents in the agency. 
My, my Navy work has nothing to do with UFOs, by the way. And um, the information that I was getting, uh, the Pelican source of information, that was all more or less casual stuff. None, none of this was official, uh, official business or anything related to uh, official Navy work. I did have official Navy work relations with the CIA having to do with underwater sound. Uh, but that was uh, independent of uh, UFOs. There are USOs, the under, under unidentified submerged objects. There have been a number of reports of things coming in and out of the water. Even There were even back in the 60s or 70s reports of uh, high-speed underwater objects down in the, uh, um, around the tongue of the ocean uh, in the Bahamas and so on. Uh, I, I'm sure there are <laughs> real objects that have been seen associated with the water. So I wouldn't be surprised, yes, water is about two-thirds of the Earth is covered with water. It would be a good place for uh, aliens if they want to be uh, hidden most of the time. It would be a good place for them to set up shop. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Well, Thank you. Thank you.